we are very lucky today to have a guest who is truly a legend in his field. And as always, we'll start our interview with the basic three questions. First, who are you? I'm Tony Isabella. I have been a comic book writer for close to 50 years and uh, still write lots of stuff. All right, that answers the what do as well. So finally, why? Why? I was dropped on my head a lot as an infant. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> We're off to a great start here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Uh, I, I come from a family of would-be jugglers, and they just were not very good at it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, uh, do, do you have anything right now that you're working on that you'd like to tell our audience about? Well, uh, one of the things I'm doing, there's a, a syndicated newspaper feature called Last, excuse me, Last Kiss by a friend of mine, John Lustig. And what John does is take random panels from old romance comics and write gags for them. Well, John's been doing this for about 15 years, all by himself, and recently decided he needs some help. So about, uh, I write about one or two gags a week for him for this feature. And while I've done syndicated, you know, comic strip work in the past, it's always been anonymous. John actually credits, whenever one of my gag appears, John credits it. And I'm having a great time with it. I mean, they're just wacky gags, and, and I seem to have connected with his audience. So that's something I do every week. Um, I am getting gearing up to, to resume doing Tony Isabella's bloggy thing. Uh, and while all this is going on, I'm, I'm um, developing – a comic project for a friend of mine who I think could become, you know, the next media, big media star. Um, I'm developing a TV series uh, for one of the cast members of Black Lightning. Uh, and I'm just doing all sorts of stuff like that. I mean, I, I have a, a wide range of interests and I'll be addressing most of them because it's pretty clear that I'm not going to be going to too many conventions this year, if any. Um, with this uh, this TV series you're producing, um, will this be like a spinoff of Black Lightning focusing on... No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not producing it. This is in the really early stages. Okay. Uh, I, I've become close with several of the cast members, and, and one of them and I were, were talking about something, and I came up with, with a concept that, that I thought would work for him. But it's in the very early stages. Um, one of the things I'll be doing in the next week or two is, is writing kind of a mini Bible for this new series. And if he likes it and I like it, then we'll start talking about, well, who do we pitch this to? But it's not a spinoff of Black Lightning. It just would star uh, one of the cast members of the show. All right. Well, uh, on the on the show Black Lightning, um, how did the guest appearance that you had recently on the show come about, and what was your favorite thing about that experience? Well, I got to tell you, my experience with the Black Lightning TV show has been has been wonderful, as opposed to my experiences with DC Comics. Uh, early on, uh, a guy named Jeff Johns, who was an executive at DC, uh, actually was was very helpful in in coming in in arranging for DC and I to come to an agreement. It wasn't a perfect agreement, but it was a lot better than I ever had with them before. And one of the reasons Jeff did this, besides he's a stand-up guy and has always liked my writing and has always loved Black Lightning, is that he wanted to do a Black Lightning TV show, but didn't want to do it if I was going to be unhappy with it. So once that ball started rolling. Um, I was asked to write a core values paper for the show. And one of the reasons I love the show so much is that even though their Black Lightning is somewhat different than mine, they share the same core values. Um, so I wrote this, this core values paper, spent hours on the phone with Salim and Mara Braca Keel, who are the showrunners. Uh, Salim flew me out to spend a day with the writers, uh, 
really before anything other than the pilot script had been written. And all along the way, I've been treated with great love and respect from everyone on the show. Um, I've been to the set of, you know, I've hung out with cast members at conventions. I visited the set a couple of times where, you know, it's, you know, over a hundred people will come up to me and thank me for their jobs. Uh, and it's just a ball watching them put this show together. Uh, I never realized how much goes into every episode of a show and how many people work on it. Um, it is, uh, it's just an amazing thing to see. And uh, as I said, they treat me with great love and respect and they've always wanted me to do a cameo. Uh, and we finally made that happen uh, in the season finale of season three where I got to play Judge Isabella, along with uh, Judge Von Eden uh, and an actress, uh, Jennifer Krista Palmer, who, who was the chief judge and, and really, you know, was was who I looked to for cues as I did my, my bit. Uh, and it was fun. It was fun. I got, I got paid an obscene amount of money to do this, to do what amounted to one line because, you know, I had more than one. I had two lines, but one of them got cut. Uh, you know, during the editing process. So, but again, it, it's just wonderful. I mean, I get to hang out with people. I mean, one one time when I was on the when I was on the set, set I had lunch with with Marvin Jones, who plays uh, Tobias Whale, and Bill Duke, you know, who's a legend, who plays Agent Odell, and and that was the way the lunches are on the set. I mean, everybody hangs out together, cast, crew. Um, production people, uh, builders. It's really a, the show is, is like a family to me. It's like this extended family and, and the kind of love I get from, from people there, uh, is just amazing. Um, one time when I was on the set, um, China who plays, uh, Black Lightning's youngest daughter comes out of a scene and she's wearing her costume and she sees me. She had not realized I was going to be on the set that day. She sees me. She literally squealed with the light and ran over to hug me. <laughs> um, and that's, that's what I get from everybody on the, on that show. Uh, this is not normal for comics creators. We are usually, you know, the, the stuff made from our, our creations usually doesn't follow our core values this closely. And we're certainly not treated this well for the most part. But from day one, the Black Lightning TV series has always, you know, made me feel part of their family. Uh, I've never had an official role with the show, but, you know, I, I like to think I'm the show's number one fan. <laughs> All right. Uh, just something you mentioned earlier. Uh, you do have a history of uh, creative struggles with DC Comics. Has that gotten better over the years, or are you still cautious no. with their use of no, good no? Characters? There was a time when I thought things were going to get better, and and quite frankly, all they wanted to do was try to keep me happy, because they were afraid I'd say mean things about the TV series. Because again, one hand not knowing what the other was doing, they didn't realize I already had a relationship and a great relationship with the TV series. The problem with Black, with DC and especially Black Lightning, besides the fact that the company rarely keeps its agreements with me, or if they do, they keep the letter of them but not the spirit, they don't understand Black Lightning. And that's really idiotic because he's not that complicated a character. He, he cares about three things more than anything else. His family, which would include Lynn Stewart, uh, his students, and his community. And after I did the Black Lightning Cold Dead Hands series, which was kind of a reboot of the character uh, that made him a little bit younger and set it, set it in my hometown of Cleveland, they decided that Black Lightning was best served by being basically, you know, Batman's support Negro. He leaves his family. He leaves his students. He leaves his community to do jobs that for Batman because Batman's unemotionally is emotionally unavailable because of whatever's going on in Batman's own book. 
So basically, you know, this current Batman and the Outsiders book is awful. They don't understand Black Lightning. Most of the characters are treated badly or not written well. And it's, you know, there's there's a phrase racist cops use, um, which they abbreviate as uh, NHI, no humans involved. And that's what racist cops say to each other to denote that whatever crime scene or situation they're going into just involves people in col of color. So in their mind, no humans involved. That's what Batman of the Outsiders is in this way. Nobody, None of these so-called heroes are actually helping people. They're just doing Batman's bidding. Um, Batman's bought a penthouse apartment for Black Lightning uh, in Gotham City. Uh, and apparently he's, you know, apparently, you know, after, you know, at night when he leaves, he leaves the money on the dresser for, for Black Lightning. Uh, it's just an awful, insulting portrayal of a character that means so much to so many people. And and it's not an ego thing on my part. Ego went out the window when when this started happening to me at conventions. Someone will come up to me with tears in their eyes and hug me because Black Lightning was the first time they saw themselves in a comic book. And and that was you know, that that was a life changing thing for me the first time it happened. I realized for the first time just how important this character is to so many readers and now to so many viewers. And so whether D C likes it or not, I will always call them out on their crap when they do Black Lightning wrong. And right now they're doing Black Lightning about as wrong as you can possibly do them. Thank God the show is there because the show gets it. The show is an authentic portrayal of Black Lightning. So the TV show is able to follow more of your vision for your character. It, do you feel that that is contributed by your set of core values that you were able to give to the show? Sure, sure. I mean, they, we share the same core values for the characters. Um, they have done things with the characters that I never had the means to do. I mean, when you have actual actors playing these characters, you can take them a lot farther. Um, I've told um, Salim and, and Marvin, who plays Tobias Whale, and, um, and James Remar, who plays... Uh, Peter Gamby and, and uh, Christine Adams, who plays Lynn, that they have done things with my characters that I never, I never dreamed could be put on, on the screen because I was, of course, limited by my comic book thinking. Um, Tobias Whale and Peter Gamby are so much better in the show than I ever wrote them. Um, so I, you know, so, so the show is an extension of my original core values for the character. Uh, and they, they do a brilliant job of it. The writing is great. The acting is great. Um, the sets are amazing. Uh, I, uh, I remember the first time I was on the set, um, they weren't using the Club 100 set, which is the nightclub owned by Tobias Whale. And I would go into that set from time to time and and inevitably, there were crew members taking naps in the booths. <laughs> uh, but you know, I you know, I got you know, I I got all around. I was all around Peter Gamby's tailor shop, uh, which is a great set. Uh, they even had me wear a vest, the vest that's used for the stand-in for lighting purposes and everything. And it actually does light up, uh, as does Cress's costume. But Cress's costume is digitally enhanced in the editing process. So yeah, every visit to the set has just been amazing. Is there any sort of almost surreal feeling to know that you created these settings and then being able to walk into them in real life? Yes, yes. Um, actually, the, the um, most, the most uh, I guess, shocking to me episodes of that sort did not happen on the set. Um, 
as I said, Black Lightning Cold Dead Hands is set in Cleveland, which is, is pretty much where I live. The local TV station that airs Black Lightning wanted to do an interview with me about the comic book and about the TV show. And they asked me, you know, well, why don't we, we call one of the comic shops and do the interview there? And I said, well, yes, we could do that. It's been done a thousand times before, but we could do that. But instead, let me suggest this. The the key, the final battle in Cold Dead Hands takes place at the old abandoned Coast Guard station, which is, you know, right near downtown Cleveland. Um, I said, why don't we film it there? You can show panels of the of of the the Coast Guard stations as it's shown in the comic book, and we can do it there. Now, I had never been to the to the Coast Guard station. I sent photo references to the artist, Clayton Henry, who did a great job capturing it. So I'm there for the interview, and it suddenly hits me that I'm standing in in the panel of my own comic book. And that was, that was a, a pretty wild feeling, because the artist had nailed the look of the place so well that, that I felt like I had stepped into the comic book. So uh, looking at uh, the comics industry, TV, and, and superhero shows and such overall, especially with the CW, uh, how do you feel about the push to increase representation in the media in the modern day? And do you feel like you helped in at least a small way to make this happen and get that ball rolling? Well, I will tell you the reason, you know, people ask, well, why did, why did this, you know, you know, white guy create Black Lightning. And it's because when, you know, when I was growing up in Cleveland, I was a teenager in Cleveland. Uh, Cleveland was a very segregated city. Uh, blacks were probably on one side of town, whites on the other. The first black friends I made were comic book fans that came from the east side of Cleveland to the west side of Cleveland to attend... Um, comic book club meetings. I had started this comic book club in, in one of the West Side Recreational Centers. And, you know, meeting these guys, becoming friends with them, <coughs> excuse me a minute, um, it struck me that, you know, it's a shame there aren't more characters that look like my friends. Um, it wasn't, you know, diversity wasn't part of my language then. But fairness was, and it just didn't strike me as fair. So I always told myself, if I ever got into comics, I would do my best to work on characters of color and and create new characters of color for the comics. Um, at Marvel, I worked on things like Power Man and the Falcon. I created Misty Knight. Um, and then when I got to DC, I was able to create a character from scratch, uh, Black Lightning, and and that's probably my signature creation. I mean, I have others. I created Tiger. I created uh, Black Goliath. I created uh, Misty Knight. But Black Lightning is, is my signature creation and the one I'm most proud of and the one that has had the most effect on it, on on comics. And and I I've long since lost count of how many comics creators, uh, especially comics creators of color, who have told me that Black Lightning was pivotal to, the, to their uh, growing up in comics. And today I feel, you know, my, my definition of diversity to today is that if we have readers out there, they should see themselves, you know, in the comics in a respectful manner. Except for the villains, of course, you can crap on them all you like. <laughs> um, so, you know, I've had gay characters. I think there should be gay characters. Uh, there should be, uh, I am not a person of faith, uh, which is kind of strange since Black Lightning and his family so clearly are. But I think people of faith should be represented, represented in the comics respectfully. And generally in the past, you know, when we've had people of faith, uh, they've been the villains. They've been, you know, the bigots. Uh, they've been the witch burners. Uh, they've been the anti-mutant people. Um, 
And I love to see that kind of thing changing. I mean, if I ever write comics again, which is really iffy because, you know, the comics industry, you know, isn't kind to, to people who are, you know, pushing 70. Um, and if indeed there's even going to be a lot of comic books in the future. Uh, but if I do write more comic books, and I do have several things in mind, uh, you will see me continue putting diverse characters in uh, in my comics. In, in Black Lightning, Cold Dead Hands, which I think is the best thing I've ever written, uh, we have gay characters. We have, um, you know, both male and female. We have, uh, you know, black characters. Uh, we have, obviously, black characters. We also have a shape-shifting alien uh, who is probably, you know, the most illegal immigrant you could think of. He's a shape-shifting, he's a shape-shifting, gender-fluid um, alien from another planet uh, who was supposed to die, and, and I ended up, every time I wrote him, I liked him better, so I didn't kill him. Uh, so, but yeah, and I, I'm a big believer in diversity, and you'll see, you know, again, if I write more comic books, you'll see more of that from me. All right. Uh, so for Black Knight, Black Lightning as a character, is he based in any way by someone you knew in your past, like from growing no. up? No, no. Um, I mean, I had good teachers, but none of them were quite like uh, Black Lightning. Um, I did steal the business about a, a, him coming back to his old school to teach from Welcome Back, Cotter. Uh, <laughs> but... But no, I mean, no, he wasn't. He, 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 what he came from was my desire, you know, to create a, a African-American superhero who was really, in my mind, a step, a step above the others. I love the Black Panther, but he's an African king. You know, I love Luke Cage, but he, but, but unfairly or not, he was an ex-con in one of the stupidest things any Marvel writer ever did. The Falcon was turned into a, to into a former criminal. Um, they just weren't they just weren't the black hero I wanted to do. So, but they were all valuable learning experiences, and um, I think I did a decent job in them. And then when I came to DC, I was able to cre create Black Lightning. But even from the start, I was fighting with them. When I got to DC. You know, they had they had recruited me from Marvel. They had offered me a great deal, which, of course, they didn't honor. But one of the things they handed me, they had had two scripts of a character called the Black Bomber. The Black Bomber was a racist white guy who took part in chemical camouflage experiments in Vietnam to let him blend into the jungle better. This show had no effect on him while he was in Vietnam, but when he got when he would get home in times of stress, he would turn into this black superhero. The black superhero didn't know that he was really a white racist. The white racist didn't know he turned into a black superhero. He just thought he had blackouts. Um, each of them had a girlfriend that witnessed the transformation and apparently never said anything to them. Um, in each of the two scripts, as the white racist, he saves somebody who he can't see clearly and then gets all bent out of shape because he risked his life for a black person. And to add the final cherry on this vile, vile Sunday, uh, his uniform basically looked like a basketball uniform. So DC hands me these two scripts and say, we would like you to punch them up and then take over the book with the third issue. And I said, and I read them, and then I got back to DC, and I said, you can't do this. And they go, what do you mean we can't do this? We paid for the scripts. I said, these scripts are offensive. They are the most offensive things I have ever read in comics. Uh, if you publish these scripts, uh, if you publish this comic book, People will come to your offices with pitchforks and torches, and they go, well, how could you possibly know that? I go, because I'll be leading them. 
Uh, it took me weeks to boil down the argument that convinced them to ditch this character, which was a question. Do you really want your first headline black superhero to be a white racist? And they finally agreed, yeah, I guess that's not a good idea. So I basically had three weeks to um, create Black Lightning in this world. Uh, I created everything about Jefferson Pierce in this world before I created, you know, any of the superhero stuff. Uh, in fact, about an hour, hour and a half before the pitch meeting at which I was going to pitch this character to um, Joe Orlando and Sal Harrison, I suddenly realized that I had neglected to give him a superhero name or powers or anything like that. But comic writers are trained to think fast on their feet. And I was wandering around the office and I saw, I think it was a rough sketch of Wonder Woman. It was for a cover of Wonder Woman lassoing a black lightning bolt. And and somebody had jotted copy on it like, Hera help me stop this black lightning from destroying the city. And this was the 70s and, and I'm thinking, black lightning, that's catchy. So that's where I got the name for the character. And once I had the name, you know, it wasn't brain surgery to give him electrical powers. But I had made him an Olympic athlete because I knew he'd have to be physical. I decided I wanted him to, to be in suicide slum in the inner city of Metropolis because I preferred down-to-earth superheroes um, over the big cosmic guys. Uh, I knew I, you know, I, I basically, everything I did for his, to create his world and the people around it was to to give me the tools I would need to write what I hoped would be exciting stories that would appeal to to our readers. Cool. So essentially, when creating the character of Black Lightning, you wanted to start with the personal story, and the the whole theme of the superpowers was you know, was a last minute thought. So you wanted to tell yeah. the story. The the best to me to my mind the best characters have that human story um and and you know i've always you know i mean that's that's what attracted me you know i was about ready to get out of comics when i discovered marvel comics and what stan lee and jack kirby and steve ditko did they made these characters real people and that's what that's what appealed to me that's what that's got me that made me want to write comics myself and I always, you know, I get to know the characters first. If I know the characters, if I made the characters interesting, the stories will come. It's beautiful. Um, let's see. So is there a character, a superhero or not, that you always wish you could have written for? You know, there, there's a bunch of those. Um, I... Um, there was a time when I really wanted to write Batman until DC made him so toxic. Um, I love the challenges of the unknown, the originals uh, created by, by Jack Kirby. Uh, but the one time I had an opportunity to write them, I kind of froze because I love the characters so much. Um, I'm a big fan of, of, of Lee Falk's The Phantom from the newspaper strips. Um but, you know, there's it, so many different things because, again, it, it's like I was a while back uh, a DC executive. This is what they were still pretending that they wanted to work with me. Um, said they were looking for a new take on one of their characters. And it wasn't a character I'd ever really thought about. But the way my mind works, within an hour and a half, I had a new take on the character that I really liked. Um, their lame reason for rejecting this was that they didn't feel the character had a had enough motivation uh trust me the character had plenty of motivation and my response was them to them was well you know not every superhero can watch his parents gun down in an alley or or come from a planet that just blew up uh his motivations were very human were very real uh but again it's 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 a game companies like dc will play they'll pretend they want to work with you but then they'll shoot down anything you you give them, no matter how good it is. Uh, I pitched a graphic novel that they thought was brilliant. But then when I 
gave them pro- the proposal, which was exactly what I had talked about, they at that point decided, oh, we've decided to do to not do so many Batman graphic novels, even though this wasn't really a Batman graphic novel. And as, of course you've noticed, there's been like no Batman graphic novels available for sale. Uh, so, but no, it's, you know, Marvel's turned down stuff for me too. But Marvel's always given me reasons that I can accept that we're not just BS. So really, I mean, at this point in my career, I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm working on stuff. Whether it'll ever be brought to the marketplace or not, I don't know. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to stop writing until I can't see the screen. (laughs) We're going to around the end of our time, but uh, just one last question. In your career, is there anything you would have done differently if you knew then what you do now? Oh, my God, I would have gotten my agreement with DC in writing. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I believe that they would honor their agreement with me, um, and they never put the, the original Black Lightning deal in writing and indeed started violating it within a week of, of, of our agreeing to it. So, yeah, get it in writing. And get a get a lawyer to look over it. I have a very fine attorney right now, who's worked out very good deals, you know, very good agreements for me with both DC and Marvel. Uh, Marvel always has always treated me with respect. I've never had to chase Marvel for money. DC, at least for the most part, will honor the letter of the agreement, while you know, doing the mamba all over the spirit of the agreement. So, but yeah, that's um, the thing. Get it in writing. Get it in writing. All right. So, two lessons for today. Get it in writing and get a good attorney. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today. Uh, Mr. Tony Isabella, everybody. Woo! All right. Once again, thank you for coming on the show. Happy to do so.